Thanks for coming. <laughs> um, this is a, a not a very technical, not a programming session. I um, tried to do an, an overview um, of um, different MIDI translation scenarios, um, in particular translating MIDI protocols to each other and um, translating different protocols or things to MIDI. Um, myself, I just got this lovely introduction, so um, you already know who I am. <laughs> um, I've been doing MIDI translation for a long time. I came out with my software MIDI translator in 1998, so it's in its, in its 20th year. Um, you are my audience, and um, I hope you have some interest in MIDI and that you don't know everything about it already, because then um, it will, will be very boring. But I try to cover so many topics that everybody will his share of boredom today. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, hang in, hang in there. <laughs> um, as a general, um, the general types of MIDI translation. Um, there is MIDI to MIDI. You can have one MIDI signal and translate it to a different signal, control change to a system exclusive message or MPE and new standard to general MIDI. Um, but you can also take MIDI um, and translate to other things like OSC, which is a similar but different protocol, or even to keystrokes. And I will get to st stuff like that later. Um, oop, that was something completely wrong. <laughs> Uh, how do I do that? Sorry about that. Oh, it's behind. The mouse doesn't work there, so I use the keys. Right, so there's also MIDI transport translation, which is like a layer below the MIDI message um, layer, and I'm not going to talk about this today. It was just been too much boring stuff <laughs> to add. Um, you see, th there are all, sometimes these little boxes with um, acronyms um, so that you don't wonder what it means. Often it will be acronyms that you already know, but I thought it would be nice to still have it in there. Um, so the general translation mechanism that I keep on referring to in, uh, in this session is uh, that there is a MIDI sender um, and then there is some kind of translation entity and um, takes that MIDI and translates it to something else. So we'll see where that goes. Just a brief background to MIDI. How many of you have used MIDI? <laughs> um, anybody who has programmed MIDI? OK, OK, so you know your stuff. <laughs> so I don't need to really explain much about MIDI. Basically, it's a control protocol. Um, you have messages like node on, node off. Uh, you don't s submit sound. I think that's um, very important to know. Uh, you just say well, you press a key, and then that information of being pressed is sent, and not what sound is supposed to sound. When you release the key, then another message is sent, note off. And when you uh, dial a knob, then just the movement is sent, and not uh, when, you, when you're not doing anything with it. Um, uh, MIDI is also a physical transport. Uh, so the original MIDI specification from 1983 um, includes the um, physical connector, those um, five pinned in MIDI ports. Uh, it's a serial protocol, quite slow, but still fast enough for um, many things that you still, that are still useful today. So um, you'll find those five pinned in ports on many new devices too. Um, it's an industry standard. Um, there's the MIDI Manufacturers Association, uh, which um, looks over the standards and creates new standards, updates uh, existing ones. And for Japan, uh, there's AME, which does the same thing, and they are in close collaboration. Um, it's just a sort of historic thing that we have two separate <laughs> MIDI associations. Um, and there's actually a lot going on. Um, every year, there are new standards or updated standards coming out and ratified uh, at the MMA. Um, the good things about MIDI and why I am standing here 
um, and why I love MIDI so much um, is that it's a, it's a very universal protocol. Um, it's usually very low um, latency and so practically real time. On most systems you get one millisecond latency or less. Um, so you can do all kinds of control um, with it. Um, I listed here some, some examples, music, uh, obviously, you play a keyboard and then somewhere else the synthesizer is creating sounds from that. Mixing consoles with faders and uh, for studios. Uh, DJ controllers are very um, easy to make with MIDI. Um, stage lighting uh, with um, appropriate converters. You can use MIDI to control all the lights on a, on a stage. But it's also used in areas like robotics or animatronics where you use the real-time information to move, uh, I don't know, robots. Um, and uh, because it's, it's real-time, um, it, it works well. But any other protocol where you're not guaranteed or where you can't really count on uh, real-time behavior, um, that could become a nightmare. <laughs> so here are some Translation basics coming up, um, uh, sort of the theory um, behind that. Um, so the concept I've already talked to you through this um, general way, um, but then um, you can, as a specific case, you can take MIDI, translate it to some other MIDI, um, but you can also take any other kind of information or message or event or trigger, take that, translate it, and again, to something completely, completely uh, different or to MIDI to execute something um, that understands MIDI. Um, for translation, the most important point is uh, to understand uh, MIDI values and to be able to translate them to something else. So um, the most common uh, value type in MIDI is seven-bit um, uh, integer. It's, uh, it's a number from zero to 127. So um, that is very easy to convert. For example, um, uh, in many systems you have real uh, numbers from zero to one. And if you want to convert that, you just scale it up. Um, uh, or, or down, actually, you divide by 127, and then you get the scaled value from 0 to 1. But unfortunately, it's not that simple. Um, many controllers have a center value. So um, to get the exact center between 0 and 127, uh, that would be 63.5. So how do you translate that, um, or, or how do you transmit that with MIDI because it's an integer value. Um, so long time ago, the MIDI association said, OK, we just define the center value to be 64. So this is off center, but um, whoever receives a value of 64 knows if it's a, if it's a panorama uh, controller, for example, OK, that's the center. Um, but it also means that uh, we have a slightly better resolution for the lower, for the left side, than for the right side. But um, it's with 128 values, you, you cannot do anything else. So for translating that to a normalized range, uh, we need to take a little bit more care of the center problem. Um, basically, uh, for all the values below 64, you use a scaling factor of 64, or Actually, yeah, if you, if you um, do the math of this, it becomes this simpler formula. So below 64, you just divide by 128. And above 64, you divide by 126. And first, you need to deduct one. So that'll work fine. It, it'll give what some people in the MMA call the bent stick curve. If you, if you draw it, um, the... Uh, the linear line will sort of change a bit the direction. But it's not a lot, and, um, and you have the benefit of a, of a true center, also in your normalized range. And you don't want, in your movie, your center to be sort of a, <laughs> a few inches off. 
<coughs> velocity is a different thing uh, with its own problems. Um, so velocity general, if you, in general, if you have a node on, um, it's how hard you press the key. Um, but uh, for historic reasons, if you send a node on message with zero velocity, it is received as a node off, or it's defined to be a node off message. So um, for node on, you cannot just say, hey, I just scale my um, velocity uh, the same way as I do for other seven bit values, um, because the value zero is reserved or makes it a different message. So um, you can only use the values 1 to 127 for node on translation, and otherwise translate it to node off. Um, 14 bit values exist in MIDI. Um, it's very similar to 7 bit translation. Um, the center is de defined to be at 8192, or in hex codes 4040. Um, this is uh, relevant for pitch band, for example, but you can also send 14 bit control changes. Um, RPNs and unRPNs are also um, 14 bit controllers. But I think the main thing here is that also here you need to take care of the correct center. Um, but you can also do uh, like on off things like a damper pedal, you press it and um, it'll send one MIDI message and when you release it, it sends a different message. And if you do that with a controller, um, the convention is to use the lower range of the values for off. And uh, if you press it, it, it sends a value between 64 and 127. Any value in that range will make it pressed, and any other value make it uh, depressed. What's that? Maybe, um, oh yeah, that, that is true. I think even physically, um, pedals um, behave in, in, the, in the wrong direction. But um, this is how MIDI is defined. So um, uh, if, if a pedal doesn't behave, then well, um, <laughs> you need MIDI translation for that then. <laughs> um, you can uh, in MIDI also have, uh, say, a knob here um, with four waveforms for the mod function. Um, and in MIDI, the typical convention is that you just divide the range in how many different um, per parameter values you have. So for this mod function, values 0 to 31 will be waveform 1, values 32 to 63 will be waveform 2, and so on. So you, as you turn the knob, it'll send one of those uh, ranges. But this kind of uh, convention also makes it possible that you combine uh, or, or connect this kind of synthesizer with a completely different device, say a, a cheap controller like this with knobs on it, and these knobs send 0 to 127, and you connect it to the mod function, and then as you slowly move, at one point it'll switch to the next, and so on. So it's, it's very interoperable like this, and good, good to know that it works like this. <laughs> Uh, last thing about value types is uh, relative values, and these are not really standardized within the MMA, so um, uh, many different ways of sending them uh, have been established by manufacturers. Um, so here is an example of a browse knob or encoder, which has like this clicky feeling, so um, it never ends, and on every click it just sends one message which says I moved it to the right, or if you're moving to the left, then uh, it sends a message that it moved to the left. So as I said, the problem is that um, it's not standardized, and here's one way of doing it. If I send one, I clicked one to the right, and if I send 65, I clicked one to the left. If I use higher values, I clicked very, or I turned very fast, and um, skipped a few clicks. But there are other conventions too. Um, using the upper half uh, in, the, in the other direction, um, so 65 will be one click to the right and 63 will be one to the left, 
or different ways, like every manufacturer does its own thing. So this is kind of a mess, but that's one of the places where a MIDI translation um, can get very handy. Um, exactly, so here are now some examples um, of translating MIDI to MIDI. Um, uh, and I tried to come up with some real world examples where it actually makes sense. So um, there are such devices, programmers, some of them really old, um, but they're still available on eBay or something, and they have a lot of faders. So some people may think, oh, that's great, I have a lighting rig and I, have, I wanna control all these lights, and here's a device with all those faders, I'm gonna connect that. But these devices send SysX message, system exclusive, which is a pr proprietary, in this case, Roland message, and um, so uh, you cannot connect it to a DAW and, or to a lighting program and then it'll just work. You need to translate it. Um, or for this example, it's an organ drawbar controller found on some uh, electronic organs. And uh, so you take this system exclusive message, which looks really awkward and hexadecimal, but it includes two numbers, which um, encodes the position. And in this case, it's easy. You just drop the second number for the position and convert it to a control change, say, on channel. Uh, con uh, control change 10 um, with value that you take from the system exclusive message. So that would be a very easy kind of translation, but very useful, because now you can use these organ faders for, um, to control something completely different in your DAW or lighting or what you like. <clears throat> Velocity curves, um, so uh, different keyboarders or piano players have different um, way of playing and um, for example, my daughter, she, she has a very light way of playing so she always needs to turn up the volume. But uh, you can fix that also by fixing the velocity curve. Um, so the norm normal player will just play that when it's forte, it'll maximize the velocity values and if it's piano, then it'll work fine. But the, the hammer kind of player is always playing very loud, very strong, and then you can apply such a concave curve uh, to the velocity to um, lift a bit uh, the, the pressure and only uh, in the high pressure ranges, um, it actually gets the, the, the dynamics. And the feather, or my daughter kind of <laughs> player, uh, could use a convex uh, translation curve. Um, there is the standard MPE that was ratified in last January, um, MIDI uh, polyphonic expression. It allows you to um, have uh, sort of per note control, pitch bend, and um, controllers. Um, it does it, um, uh, wait, and yes, so it, it usually works with MPE synthesizers, but it's not so hard to make it work with just any kind of s standard off-the-shelf synthesizer. For example, a general MIDI synthesizer, which is an old standard, but there's still many devices around that support general MIDI. And um, so it's not so hard to do the translation. MPE works by doing a channel cycling. So you press one node and that'll be on channel one. You press the next, or actually channel two, press the next node, it'll be on the next channel and so on. And now when you wiggle a finger, for example, on a C board, I got one here. <laughs> uh, so when you wiggle it then it'll send the um, maybe a pitch change message only on that channel for that node. So only that node will, will have this wiggle or if you move it up or down. And um, that uh, is uh, usually not working with a general MIDI synthesizer which has, where every channel is separate and you can define different sounds for every channel. Channel 10 is drums. But um, it allows you to set up um, 
which channel is drum, for example. So um, I would turn that off for MPE. And um, also, um, you can define the MPE uh, or configure the MPE device, which channels to use, and um, there are zones. If you want to know, know more about this, uh, the, the spec is available at midi.org. Um, but the, the key to make this kind of MPE device work with a, with a normal general MIDI synthesizer is to duplicate all ma messages on the master channel, on, on channel one, to all other channels. So if you change the patch, uh, it'll change it on all channels. And um, that way, um, every note you play will have the same uh, patch, same sound. And we're still talking about MIDI to MIDI translation. Um, so here are some more general concepts, what you can do to um, some, some more uh, elaborate things, like MIDI macros. You touch one key, and you translate it to a whole set of messages. Um, for example, on a band, in a band on stage, the keyboarder can set up a few keys on, his, uh, on, on a device to um, configure the, the other MIDI devices on stage. And there could be many, like drum computers, or um, there are uh, distortion or effects devices for guitar players. Um, so on one push of a button, um, the keyboarder would sort of reconfigure uh, all MIDI devices on stage with such uh, macros. Um, and that could also be done in, a, in, in the other way around, that uh, you configure one button, but it always does something else. I mean, one example would be that uh, every, every time you press it, it'll advance to the next song of, of, the, of the set. Um, and you can do, go even further with some logic or like a scripting language, add layers, um, have conditional execution. Um, uh, you, if, you, if you have like variables, you can remember state and recall it later on. Um, so there is, um, that allows for a lot of more elaborate scenarios. Uh, one um, very uh, useful thing is LED feedback. Um, there are many controllers w where the buttons have LEDs built in. So you can, um, and you can control those LEDs via MIDI. Um, and I created this quick video. So that works. <laughs> right, so on to the, to the next um, broader um, uh, chapter, the protocol translation, um, where we go from MIDI to a different protocol or from a different protocol to MIDI. Uh, that's how it looks like then. Um, how many of you have heard of OSC? Okay, pretty much everyone. Um, it's used mainly, or it's coming from the academic world, and um, it lacks a bit um, the standardization of messages. So um, every OSC device or um, app uses sort of its own conventions, how to name messages and which kind of parameters it uses. Um, and um, it's, uh, so there is a lot of potential for translation. Oh, also OSC to OSC, but also MIDI to OSC and OSC to MIDI. Um, so um, you can have path names um, completely wild, um, and um, every message can have any number of parameters. So um, it's, it's great that you can do that, but it's uh, difficult for interoperability. Um, however, in practice, most OSC at least performance devices or like touch OSC, they typically just send one uh, parameter per message. And that's a normalized flow at zero to one. So for value translation, you would already know how to translate that 
to MIDI. Uh, HID is a human interface device. It's a protocol used mainly on USB, but also on Bluetooth for, for computer keyboards, for, for mouse, for joysticks, and others. Um, and uh, it's, uh, you can use it and take, for example, if you press key A on your computer keyboard and translate that to MIDI, that doesn't really sound very useful initially. And when people came up to me and said, hey, um, I want to do that, I said, why that? Do you want to write your massive thesis with your, with your MIDI keyboard? And, um, or, or do, and it was kind of strange. But um, there are actually um, interesting applications. Um, there was uh, one guy who, just, who told me then that he defined the upper three keys on his keyboard um, to, to generate the keystrokes in his DAW for start recording, stop recording, next track, or something like that. And nowadays, DAWs can, can often do that on their own, but um, at the time, it was really interesting. And with keystroke emulation, you can also uh, control software that, is, that doesn't, doesn't know MIDI at all, like video editing, and it works re really well. You can like a, use a DJ platter as a jog wheel and video editors like Adobe Premiere and, um, or Lightroom. Many people use MIDI translation for that because of the available of cheap MIDI controllers and with lots of buttons or, or knobs and they can tweak their images with, uh, with a MIDI controller and it's, uh, it's a much more nicer workflow than with a keyboard and mouse. Uh, for lighting, I've already mentioned that uh, stage lighting, um, you usually use DMX on stage. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of a similar protocol. Um, uh, so it, it's, there are translation boxes from MIDI to DMX or software. And um, so many people use um, standard cheap MIDI um, controllers to control their lights on stage because lighting controllers, dedicated DMX controllers are very expensive. So that works well. And it has the additional benefit that you can connect your DAW to your lighting console, which typically or historically is totally separate, audio and lighting. But now with MIDI, since you're talking the same protocol, you can get like tempo information or even more to really synchronize your music to the, to the lighting, uh, I mean, synchronize both, instead of just having the light react or, or reacting to the music or um, using a pre-programmed thing that just runs on its own. And I, I see that often on stage that the lighting seems sort of independent from what I'm hearing. And I find it much more interesting if that could be really synchronized and, and, and working together. Uh, I'm sure that most of you are uh, familiar with plugins and plugin APIs. Um, so VST or AU um, are also, can also be considered like a, like a software transport um, with own data types. Um, and um, usually that's, that's a normalized range. So translation is, uh, is possible and easy. Uh, from MIDI and to MIDI. Um, yeah, not much to say about this. So you can also translate MIDI to audio samples. Any idea what that could be? <laughs> that sounds, yeah, or a MIDI ringtone, maybe? <laughs> yeah. So a synthesizer is also, could just be considered like a MIDI translation engine. <laughs> Um, the uh, MIDI Manufacturers Association is currently working on a next generation MIDI standard uh, or protocol. And um, currently is, uh, is a word, it, already for like more than 10 years, we're, work, we're working on that. I'm heavily involved with that. And um, the main ideas are to, to keep MIDI as it is, because it has worked so, so well for, for so many years. 
um, but make it a little better. Higher resolution, more channels, more controllers, um, better timing, uh, if the transport permits. And, um, and some more um, um, added benefits like uh, per node controllers um, or uh, p uh, pitch, uh, a pitch articulation for node on. So you can, with, with your node on, you can say exactly which pitch this node should be. Stuff like that is um, currently being standardized. And uh, one um, fundamental aspect of the next generation will be uh, that it coexists with MIDI 1.0 and, um, and plays well with older MIDI 1.0 devices. But the plan is that MIDI 1.0 really doesn't stay, re doesn't become old, it, it stays. Um, it's just the um, one other way uh, to send MIDI data. And if you need high res, you would use the next generation protocol. If you need, um, if MIDI 1.0 is all you need, then you can, can just continue using it. Um, the path to next generation MIDI is uh, MIDI CI, Capabilities Inquiry. That's a standard now. It was ratified in January. And um, it basically gives you a way to query a MIDI device. Hey, do you support uh, this or that? Do you support next generation protocol? And if yes, then let's switch to it. And um, so that's how compatibility is made. Um, possible that every device starts in MIDI 1.0 mode, then it does MIDI CI um, negotiation and um, can then uh, switch to next generation MIDI. And since it is so close to MIDI 1.0, it's also very easy to translate back and forth. So even if you're doing um, next generation MIDI, um, say in, in the operating system, um, it's still very easy to uh, satisfy MIDI 1.0 software um, because you can just translate it down to, to, to old, old MIDI. <clears throat> so, beer would be a good solution, but it's temporary. <laughs> um, and here's just some uh, uh, ways how you can use or implement MIDI translation. Um, of course, most of you are programmers, so you can just start typing, uh, writing to native APIs directly, like on Microsoft and uh, Mac OS, iOS is similar. Um, but Juice, um, as you probably all know, has a very nice um, abstraction layer of, um, for, for programming MIDI, so you can receive and send MIDI data. Um, so um, uh, yeah, you can implement it like that. MIDI plugins also give you some access to MIDI, usually even further abstracted uh, from the original MIDI data, but um, that'll work fine if you, if you want to do some kind of MIDI processing. Um, often when, when you want to do MIDI translation in your own software, you need to transmit MIDI to other software or receive MIDI from, from a different software. Uh, on macOS, uh, that's a very use, uh, usual concept. You just go to all your MIDI setup, create a loopback MIDI device, and then um, two applications can communi communicate over that. On Windows, it's a bit more difficult. Um, you can get uh, loopback drivers from um, third parties, um, and there are also companies like mine, which uh, licenses uh, a virtual MIDI driver, which is not so easy to create, um, but then you can integrate it into your own software and have the ability to create named MIDI ports and then other applications can write to it and receive on it. Uh, huh, yes. <laughs> um, of course, uh, it would, uh, in many scenarios, it would be nice to have a translation layer in hardware, so you can use um, DIY um, hardware like an Arduino or Raspberry Pi and um, put your software on it. The Arduino is particularly interesting um, because it gives you different ways um, of exchanging MIDI data. You can use the, uh, configure a serial port as a MIDI port and then have sort of like DIN 
uh, MIDI DIN uh, connectors. Um, but you can also use uh, the USB interface as a USB client, so the Arduino will appear as a MIDI device connecting to a computer or to a different USB host. But there's also a USB host shield, so you can configure the Arduino as a, as a USB MIDI host, so you can connect a MIDI device to it and then do the processing in there. Lots of flexibility um, and cheap, so um, that could be a path. For software, um, I must say I am in the MIDI translation software business, so um, I don't know very well the marketplace, and um, that's for a reason because I don't want to sort of get tainted too much by how other people do things. So um, Max, uh, you probably all know it, or Pure Data are great ways to implement um, MIDI translation scenarios. Um, and my software is Bohm MIDI Translator Pro, um, which is, um, as mentioned, on the market for 20 years. Um, it allows MIDI to MIDI translation, but also um, a number of different protocols. OSC is the next big thing that will be integrated. Um, it, you can organize your translations in presets, turn on and off presets via translations. You can also do timed events. It has a small scripting language, so you can really do most of the things um, that I mentioned here in this session um, by just clicking together your rules. The, um, it's available for Windows and Mac OS, um, and you can use it on stage or in, in your actual uh, studio or something, but also many developers like it for, for quick and dirty prototyping so uh, that you can just try how would it look like if my device or my software send this kind of sequence or a system exclusive message and how does it work. And the Pong game that you saw in that little video was also entirely made in, inside MIDI Translator just by clicking together your rules and logic. <clears throat> right, so you can see it translates everything to everything. The general way um, you set up a translation rule in, in MIDI translator is uh, you define the input trigger, for example, a MIDI message. You can do some processing on it, and then there's an outgoing action. What, what is the response to that um, trigger? It can be a keystroke, can be another MIDI message, can be anything that is supported by the software. Um, for hardware MIDI translation solutions, um, I could only find this event processor plus, um, uh, which is a, is a very small, self-contained device. Um, I'm not exactly sure how it is programmed. I have not tried it. Again, not to get uh, other ideas and then, um, well, because uh, I have my own hardware MIDI translation device, uh, which is the bone box. And uh, the way the, this sort of ecosystem works is uh, it's a small, I can show it to you. Uh, it's a small uh, device. Uh, you can connect all your MIDI gear to it, uh, MIDI DIN, uh, Ethernet MIDI, uh, USB devices. And um, then uh, load any translations that you created uh, in MIDI Translator Pro, you can just load it in there and it runs it self-contained. Um, no computer necessary afterwards anymore. And now I wanted to show you something, but it lost its mind. Okay, I think, yeah. Right, so that's what I just told you. You can also connect um, actual computer keyboards to the bone box and translate that to MIDI, um, which is a fun thing for, for some people. You can also um, generate and receive serial port data um, for like specialty applications or for configuring older devices. <coughs> OSC and other HID functionality will come as a firmware update. And now I 
hope that works like this. A message. <laughs> and again, this is all just MIDI <laughs> triggered by a translation set in the boom box. As the MIDI said, do we have any questions for him? <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, you, you didn't talk about MIDI files at all. MIDI? Um, MIDI files, dot .mid. Oh, well, that's true. And that's, a, that's always been a big issue for me as a musician, sending those things around, because every door has a different way of exporting stuff and importing stuff and you never know what's going to happen. So I'm just wondering if you're planning to standardize that and standardize a MIDI insert, all those things that doors all do differently. That's do you my mean question. Uh, like, a, like a, an upgraded MIDI file format? Mm. I am not aware of that in your MIDI association. Um, but if you think that would be useful, then uh, you can join the MMA <laughs> and start a working group. It's, it's not so hard, it's, uh, it can also be a lot of fun. Um, and especially with this next generation protocol, um, we definitely will need a new um, MIDI file uh, format. So um, yeah, um, talk to me or anyone. <laughs> You're welcome. Anyone else? Hi. Um, I do actually use MIDI for control of animatronics mm -hmm. and the uh, seven bit <laughs> you know resolution of the standard controllers is, is a bit of a nightmare really so I was wondering what the planned resolution for next gen MIDI would be and whether you think um, the DAW makers will be quickly on board t to make it Usable. That's uh, two very good questions. Um, so the resolution of um, controllers in the next generation MIDI protocol is entirely confidential. We don't talk about ongoing specifications. But you could imagine um, that it could be, for example, 32 bits. Um, so you're going to skip 16 and give you us think it's, uh, it's going to be 16? 32-bit floats, maybe? Um, floats uh, is, is difficult, but I think if the container is four, four bytes, you can send 32-bit ints or floats. And the nice thing is uh, with uh, next generation MIDI, we have this MIDI CI thing, which um, we will actually talk about a little bit um, this afternoon. Um, it, um, uh, it gives you the capability of asking the receiver, hey, what do you understand? Um, which format do you like your controllers? Do you, do you speak flow? Do you speak int? Um, that is definitely one of the possibilities with, with the, these, this new MIDI CI, um, making it very flexible. But the goal is really to have 32-bit uh, available for controllers, for velocity, for yeah, many things. The, but you had a, a follow-up question to that. Oh yeah, do you think that the DAW builders will be uh, quickly on board with, with a next Right, gen? and um, we do have a few um, DAW um, manufacturers in the working group, but they're not very active. And if anybody here um, has some ideas how it should work in a DAW, then um, it would be great um, anyone who um, participates is, is very welcome and um, or just send me or someone else uh, at the MMA his ideas how it should work or what should be improved with uh, next generation MIDI in, in, in a DIW. Anyone else would like to ask a question? Sorry, this is not a question. Uh, uh, I actually want to point out that the BOM software is great. Uh, I have <laughs> a friend of mine, uh, 
uh, is one of your favorite customers, I guess, Frank Bonin from Italy. Oh, yeah. And uh, he's been using this for many years on stage with a Bluetooth controller. He can mm -hmm. skip over to the next song. He uses that. I, I think the HID integration is great. Mm -hmm. He uses that to skip over, you know, they have lyrics scrolling on screen and it just goes up and down the PDF with that, can open PDF files. Nice. I think there's, mu there's much more than, uh, than it may seem. Uh, there's mu much more need for MIDI translation than it may seem. And the next thing we're doing together, we, we're probably moving over to a, a bone box for, um, for integrating all our hardware setup together. Yes. So thanks a lot for Makes for a lot that. of sense. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> I suppose a logical follow-on question from somebody who hasn't used your software is um, why would you not use Macs? Because there's a lot of people who use Macs here and it's, it's interesting to know how yours differs. So as said, I'm not a Macs user because um, at the time I just started programming my own translation needs and then it evolved into more generic software. So um, And then I started thinking I shouldn't look too deeply into Macs because then I want to do it the same way as Max does. But um, what I hear from customers is that um, many of them say that in MIDI translator they get results much faster, but um, it is also sort of there are limits that you can, um, that you don't have in Max. So um, it, that might be true, maybe not. Maybe, maybe it's just also a, a different way of approaching MIDI translation and MIDI translator than in Max, where you sort of have the world open to everything and a MIDI translator just asks you, hey, what's your incoming action? What's your processing? What's your outgoing? Done. So it's a different level of complexity and versatility, really? Probably, yes. I, it's also a different level of price tag. <laughs> oh, and while I've got the microphone to speak mildly out of turn, because this isn't a question, in answer to your question on slide number 54, JUICE used to be an acronym, but is now just a name. I, I was sus suspecting that. <laughs> <laughs> HID and Max. <coughs> Pro probably, yes, yes, because you can create plugins. Um. I'm not a Max user either, but um, if I were to buy a product that would solve my problem, which one would it be? Was, was really what I was fulminating. How much cash do you have? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a contractor, so none. <laughs> yeah, and you have a Max box. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, so the question is if there is command line scripting for MIDI translator. Uh, not really. So there is a built-in scripting language of, which is sort of limited, but for a reason to not make it too complicated. Um, but And there's no other sort of scripting that you can do. Uh, however, um, there are translation rules that you can set up to that self-reference itself. So you can for example, load a new um, project file as an outgoing action. So you can go from one to the next. And um, uh, also, what is planned is, is a real scripting language put in sort of as a black box, and you, you type your code in there, and that would probably be more what you were asking about. <laughs> Uh, yeah, specifically, I like the idea of a Lua port because it just opens up everything on your computer to then talking to your application. Right. Ah, uh, yes. I can fire off MIDI translator stuff from the end of my Xcode script and you know, yes. that kind of we, stuff. We may think of something like that. Um, or like send generic uh, UDP packets, for example. With that, you can interface with other applications or stuff that, that you created yourself easily. Yeah. I have one question, one remark. Um, first remark, um, do you know about the retro cable, which is also a MIDI converter in hardware, where you can no. load up um, MIDI uh, translation protocols into the cable, as um, cable with a little controller, of course. It's required for the crazy MIDI implementation of Cork Volker sample, mm -hmm. for example. Nice, yeah, um, I haven't heard of it. And the question is, uh, when do you expect to uh, the first synthesizers or hardware devices to come up with a new MIDI implementation? 
support. In Next generation MIDI. When the new standard will be available? Maybe you said it, I missed so, it. Um, well, it's hard to predict the future. <laughs> That's the main problem. And um, certainly, we, we don't even talk about the specifics of, of the protocol until it's ratified. So um, I cannot say anything about the product plans of, of manufacturers. I can say that I plan to um, implement it as soon as it's ratified. I mean, make it available publicly in the bone box um, for next generation MIDI to MIDI 1.0 translation or uh, like encapsulation so that you can talk to your MIDI 1.0 device using the new protocol and using a few features like timestamping along, along the way that the MIDI 1 device doesn't use. And of course, also um, the MIDI CI capability inquiry, uh, which allows the DAW to ask the device, hey, what's your name? How many controllers do you support? Or what are your physical interfaces? Um, that shall be emulated by the bone box for, um, for your MIDI 1.0 gear. So you can set up like a DX7, and then at the DAW, it'll recognize it automatically as a DX7. That's a plan. From Ooh, I have one sneaky question, but don't forget there is food actually happening out there now. <laughs> Sorry, well, uh, um, uh, it's, it's great to have the MIDI CI capabilities. I'm a bit concerned that with there being, uh, for instance, different ways of sending messages, could be floats or integers, uh, you may be creating uh, space for devices to be on the market that, that cannot talk to each other. You know, media has worked so well for 30 years because it just works. Uh, what are you doing to actively address those concerns? Yes. So the, the gen general answer is that you will never send something that you didn't negotiate um, before that, you, that the receiver can handle it. So that's the general rule in, in MIDI CI and next generation protocol. You can go really down to, to a per message type level um, what you support and what you don't support. Um, so that minimizes the risk that you send it, uh, send the wrong message or wrong message type. And, um, but m in more particular, um, it, the, the next generation MIDI protocol is, is really very close to MIDI and doesn't allow a lot of um, options. Like usually one message is defined in, a, in one certain way, just as MIDI 1.0 does it. And um, if, you, if you receive it, you always know, okay, this, is, this field is this, that field is that, and um, no confusion possible. And there are also profiles in MIDI CI, which allow you to configure on a more general uh, term um, which kind of device you are. So um, an MPE device would, for example, um, could implement an MPE profile. So the, uh, the other side knows, okay, it's an MPE device, so I, I know this and that is a fact and this will not work. And um, that also helps interoperability. But it'll get a little bit more complicated, but also a lot of more new um, functionality. And of course, for more MIDI CI, we have that other session this afternoon. Let's yes. thank Florian again. Yeah.